I'm going to be honest here. Hank Reardon, quite frankly, is my favorite fictional character of all time. Uh, before this, it, it was Dr. Sarazawa, and Dr. Sarazawa from the original Godzilla is still really close because of how depthy he is for how little of screen time he has. But my favorite fictional character now, I have to say, after reading Atlas Shrugged multiple times, it truly is Hank Reardon. And he's always sort of been the hero of Atlas Shrugged to me, even though he's clearly not the hero, according to Ayn Rand. A a John Galt is the hero, but I don't really like John Galt. <laughs> what I'm going to be talking about here, I'm actually basing off of mainly the book, not the movies. Um, specifically, like, in, in film three, he's not even in it. They, they cut his part out completely, even though he had some of my favorite parts from part three of the book, which is too bad. Uh, and he, he's just a lot more badass as a whole. There's no really other way to describe it in the book than he is in the movie, pro mainly because a lot of his character comes up with his romance with Dagny Taggart, and that is almost completely cut out of the story in the film. So again, a lot of this is just based off of the books. So it's, it's sort of like, uh, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. It's like, why, why do I like him so much? Why do I, I like this, this simple character so much? So why do I like him so much? He, he's not an action hero or, or anything like that. He's not like a, a brilliant strategist like Thrawn. Well, the reason why I like him so much is for that reason. Hank Reardon is just a regular man. And he knows he's just a regular man, a pers but he's very persistent. And that's the beauty to his character as a whole. Because that aspect and what he does is basically everything I aspire to be. Even before I read Atlas Shrugged, he's someone who a lot of people will see him as an asshole and call him very emotionalist and just a, a kind of a jerk but yet to others would see him as a, as a leader, an innovator, a man of the mind, as, as the book would call it. And I want to be that. Uh, I was told by the former head of, of the film department where I w was going, and she said, Adam, your problem is, is that you have an ego. Egos are bad. And I said, no, egos are not bad. No, and, I, and I looked at the head of the film department in the eyes and I said, no, I, I would rather have an ego and piss a few people off than to be a peon for the rest of my life. And that's Hank Reardon. Hank Reardon is just like that. And, and it's utterly inspiring in how he's written in the book. His big scenes, I, I just absolutely love. Like, when, when he tells the, the State Science Institute to basically go fuck themselves, he's like, tell me, is Reardon Metal good? And the, the State Institute can't give him an answer, and he's like, Reardon Metal's good. You know, there's that sort of ego to him that I love. There's that sort of, he knows when something's good, and he doesn't give a shit if anybody in his way says it's bad. If he knows it's good, he's going to use it. And he's going to try to sell it, and he's going to try to profit from it. And I've always really liked that. My film, Which Way They Walk, the character Mr. Thompson, who unfortunately I played out of default more than that I wanted to play him, is heavily based off of Hank Reardon. Uh, Mr. Thompson is a flawed man who grows and learns who he truly is compared to the world around him, reality that exists in the world around him, and that's Hank Reardon in a nutshell. So so, Mr., so Hank Reardon has inspired me in, in many ways, from business practices to you know, how to, how to look at life in, in many ways, and, and so on and so forth. And that's a lot more than a lot of, like, fictitious characters can do. You know, a lot of fictitious characters that I like, admittedly, I like because they have really, they have a lot of depth to them. And Hank Reardon certainly has a lot of depth to him, but he's more than that. This is literally somebody you can look up to and aspire to be, which is more than a lot of, a lot of other, you know, characters. Reardon was not born a great man. <laughs> Reardon made himself, which I love, um, this idea of you didn't make that, you know, President Obama's great saying during the 2012 election, is retarded to Hank Reardon, a and it has always been stupid to me as well, that whole statement that you, that you didn't make, that yes, I did. You know, I'm the one that got the people together to make this film, or I was the one that worked hard and got those scholarships. You know, I earned it. Other people didn't do that. 
that it was all me. And Hank Reardon has that that mentality in a nutshell, and I and I love it. How he looks at it, he's like, I am the reason I am here today. I am the reason why I'm growing. I'm the reason why I'm building my way to the top. I'm, for example, I made the movies I did, not somebody else. So this whole idea that you know, like the Obama Obamas and the, the Democrats are spreading, or the liberals, the liberal progressives are spreading that we all made it is bullshit. It's not only me, but Hank Reardon as well. He starts off working in the mine for iron ore, you know, he, which of course you know, he, he builds up and everything like that. And it, it's hard work that most people would quit quickly. You know, most people would, would have left there, said that work was too hard, and they would quit, especially in, in that society that is described within the book as it's becoming more social and less, you know, fiscal. Well, he sees a lot of potential here to grow and, yes, become rich to better himself. So he works and he works and he works. And over the course of several, several years, he starts climbing the ranks uh, at this mine until one day he outright buys it. He buys the mine and renames it Reardon Steel after himself because he's quite honestly and rightfully so proud of his name. Now that's another problem that a lot of people would have with Hank Reardon as a character is that he's, he has an ego when it comes to his name. He's proud of his name. I've always scoffed at, at people who are like, how dare you name something after yourself? How dare you have pride in something that you're doing? How dare you love your name? And, and so on and so forth. And, and I've always scoffed at those people, you know, because I named my film production company A and Productions after myself because I'm proud of it. I'm proud of what I put out, even if it's crap. You know, I'm proud that I'm putting something out in general and that, you know, some people are listening. And, and, and I'm proud of that. And I love them for that. You know, people like Roger Corman, the Corman Company, that's named after him, but people don't really complain about that. Tommy Wiseau, Produ Wiseau Productions, people don't really complain about that. Well, they do, but you know what I mean. So I've always scoffed at people who just say that you should never name a company after yourself. And, and Hank Reardon, being very proud of his name, names his company Reardon Steel. He, he starts making steel and is rich because of his own hard work, which makes him even prouder. Uh, he's earned his money. To him, he's earned his money, which he clearly has in the context of the book. Though in the process, this pisses off those around him because they want a piece of him. They're jealous of his success. They're jealous of what he, what he's created, and they disguise that jealousy as a form of, oh, you're treating the workers bad. Oh, you need to sprinkle your money down. Oh, you need to be taxed, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you know, these are like unions and, and government bureaucrats and, and crap like that. But what I love about Hank Reardon is instead of giving into it, he fights it the entire way. He doesn't give a shit because he looks down at the workers that are working for him and he says they're working hard. They've, they're earning their money. They're working hard for me. And he's, he's proud of them just as much as he's proud of himself because they're earning their living making him money. You see, that's the misconception of you know Hank Reardon in a nutshell. A lot of people see him as just this utter prick who literally is is just thinking of himself which that's you know the idea of objectivism which is the idea that's promoted by atlas shrugged is about selfishness you put your own love above everyone else your own your own self above everyone else uh which i agree with completely but yet another component of objectivism is you never expect the unearned so he looks down at his workers in the mines, and they have earned everything they've got. They're earning their wages. And Hank Reardon does not want to fuck them over. Because, see, that goes against objectivism in a nutshell as well. You're, you're fucking somebody over, which means that now you're going to start earning the unearned. So because they're earning their living, and they're working for him, and they're working hard, he treats them well. Because if he didn't treat them well, then he would be earning money, and it would be unearned. I suppose the next thing in his life was that he wanted to achieve love. You know, after uh, after achieving success, after achieving achieving the goal of becoming a mogul, of, of becoming a, a, almost a steel tycoon in the country, and, and so on and so forth, and even inventing his own steel, he wanted to achieve love, which love to me is something you do not achieve, you earn. 
uh, which is one of the flaws of Hank Reardon, and that kind of comes up later. So like Hank Reardon, he, he's got his money, he's got his business, it's all going pretty good despite some unions wanting to shut him down and he just doesn't give a shit. And he truly loves his business, he truly loves working with these people and he truly loves earning his money. But it's nothing physical. You know, there's no body to come home to at night. There's no one to hold him. There's no one he can hold. There's, there's no one at home, basically. So he marries this woman named Lillian. And I don't think Hank Reardon ever really loved her. And I don't think she ever really loved him. I believe she married him for his money and social status. And that's it. What he did get from her, though, is, is physical pleasure. You know, sex. But that's it. And it is quite clear to, to Hank Reardon that he basically misinterprets this physical pleasure as love uh, on both his end and hers. And especially the more as time goes on, he realizes that he wants something more, but it's not there. And he will never get it with, with Lillian. And quite frankly, Lillian is a cunt. Uh, she's the worst kind of person, in my opinion, uh, in the book. And, and, and she's the kind of person that I despise above most others. She, she's just a despicable human being. Out of all the characters, bad people in Atlas Shrugged, she's the one that I dislike the most. What she cares about the most is appearances. She's very clear about this, and I hate people that think that way. They care about how they look, what they wear, how others see them in public. That is what they focus on and that is what they care about. I never gave a shit because I want to do what I need to do. Be it buy something or to make something. I never gave a flying fuck. Hank Reardon is kind of that same way though. He gets roped into Lillian because he wants a love that he doesn't know yet that he's just never going to get with Lillian. Uh, and she just cares about how others views her while Hank Reardon puts up with it again because she gives him something that he thinks is love but he doesn't quite understand which is a bit of his tragedy he's almost like a little child and the proof of this is uh, Hank Reardon finally makes his first medal Reardon medal something that he invented he found the formula for it and he made it it's stronger cheaper and better than regular steel it would revolutionize the steel industry immensely and he would have taken over because it's so good or the first thing he makes out of this metal you know is a bracelet for Lillian and she goes is it a napkin ring is this a joke and she scoffs at it his own mother I believe that's his mother says that he should have bought her a, a diamond bracelet for her pleasure not his she only wears it, as she calls it, as, as a chain of bondage to show the selfishness of Reardon, which clearly kills him inside. Instead of wearing this bracelet as something of pride, of something of joy, she wears it as, as, a, as a joke to basically, in her own ways, insult Hank Reardon's selfishness. A form of mockery that he dare think of giving her something of value to not only her, but him as well something mutual. This is very hard to explain. So let's say my lover, he, he, he gives me something of value to him. Something that's very precious to him and he gives it to me as a gift. I would fawn over it. I would love it. I would cherish it. Because if he gives something of value to him, to me, that shows not only that he truly loves me or that he really respects me, you know, you know something along those lines. But it means he's willing to part with it because of how much he likes you, you know, and so on and so forth. And the first thing that Hank Reardon thinks of when, when it's like, let's pour something, let's make some steel, is he makes a bracelet for her. And I would always say that, that if, you know, I, if I was dating a girl, the first gift I would give her would probably be a bracelet. And it would be the Hank Reardon model bracelet that they made from Atlas Shrugged just because of the symbology behind it. I, I would easily do that. And by the way, I think the design that the movie made was, a, was beautiful anyways, but I just think it, it has some more value and shows that somebody loves you more. 
And, and it's very clear that Hank Reardon is trying with Lillian. And it is at this moment that he officially gives up with her, with Lillian. He officially gives up. He's like, I'm not happy with you at all. I'm not happy with you. You just don't get me. Somebody who does get me would realize the importance of this gift that I'm giving you. But Lillian does not. And this is where Dagny Taggart comes in. So, so Reardon finally began to realize his distaste for Lillian after that moment and, and those around her. So he'd work harder and harder and harder at his factories and he'd be watching over the men working for him. And, and, and to Lillian, he worked too hard and he wasn't romantic enough. He wasn't what she wanted and she wasn't what he wanted. And though she stays there for social status and appearances, which is wrong. And the more Lillian wanted him, Hank Reardon, the more he pushed, the more she, she pushed Reardon away, because her love was not the love Reardon craved. She wanted appearances, the appearance of love. He wanted love, pure, selfish love. So, what was the one thing that he could go to to escape, where he could literally feel that love? He can enjoy it. That was his work. Reardon genuinely loves his his work. He loves his company. He loves the people working for him. He loves everything that has to do with Reardon Steel, which is very admirable. And so as Lillian tries to come after him, Reardon retreats to his job. He retreats to his work more and more and more, more longer and grueling hours, more staying in the office and so on and so forth. Uh, it was the only thing in his life at this time that gave him this key element and that is pure, unadulterated joy was working at that factory. And that's something totally lacking in America today, by the way. A pride in one's work. It's almost like pride is a dirty work, uh, is a dirty word now here in this country, and it's too bad. Uh, be it, you know, for somebody else, you know, pride for somebody else, or for yourself, more importantly for yourself. It's like it's such a dirty word. So in comes Dagny, uh, this beautiful woman who comes in asking for his steal against many of the other people who fought Hank. She sees something in Reardon Metal, because she's a great business person, Dagny Taggart. She's uh, one of the, the co-heads of Taggart Transcontinental, which in many ways she's the only one there keeping him afloat, her and her assistant, the only ones keeping uh, that place afloat, because James Taggart, her brother, is a complete buffoon, and is very much so like Lillian, in that he only cares about you know, appearances. So Dagny comes waltzing in, asking for his steal. And an attraction immediately starts as he watches this woman, Dagny Taggart, who too loves her work beyond all else and knows that it gives her unadulterated pleasure working for Transcontinent, Taggart Transcontinental. And she also took pride in what she created. And that she approached him not expecting the unearned. She did not come in there and expected him to give her this medal for free by order of the government. She could have, but she did not. She instead took the right way and was expecting value for value. You see, if she bought the steel from Reardon, then that would keep the Taggart Railroad, or the Taggart Railway open. It would keep the, the stuff moving, the stuff that this country needs to move. So it would keep her open and she'd be making money off of it. And at the same time, the money she gives to Hank Reardon also keeps him open. You see, it's value for value. Trade for trade, value for value. And it's a beautiful thing. That's why I love capitalism so much. Laissez-faire capitalism. True capitalism is that it is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. It literally is trading value for value. And this is the moment where Hank Reardon truly began to realize that he no longer did love his actual wife, Lillian, but began to fall and fall hard for Dagny. When Dagny traded Lillian, this scene is very key, at a, at a dance or a ball. You know, I think it was their wedding anniversary, actually. Dagny sees the, the Reardon steel bracelet on Lillian, and she has this diamond necklace on. And she goes up to Lillian and says, this is a beautiful bracelet. And Lillian scoffs it off, and she says, I'll make you a trade. 
this bracelet, uh, this necklace, this diamond necklace, for that bracelet. And Lillian agrees, because to her, this is such a, a great trade-off. This crappy, quote-unquote, bracelet for this wonderful, beautiful diamond necklace. And so she takes it without hesitation. And immediately, Dagny puts on that bracelet. Hank Reardon realized, oh my god, I love this woman. I need this woman. I want this woman. I crave this woman. I crave everything of her, from her body to her mind to her heart. He wanted her. Because Dagny wore it with pride. Not as an insult to Reardon, like Lillian, but wore it with utter pride. And this kind of confused Reardon. You know, how he was feeling towards her, how he started thinking of her and, and everything like that. He, he was married to his wife. You see, Hank Reardon has this, this idea of, of morality that is sort of admirable in, in many ways, but it, it ultimately leads to his downfall with Dagny. Um, and so, yet, yet here he is, you know, he feels like he has an obligation to his wife because she's his wife, but yet here he is basically pawning over Dagny. And he doesn't want to. Well, he, well, it's weird. He wants to, but there's something within him that keeps holding him back from her. And that, that's Lillian. So, eventually, after the success of the John Galt line, Dagny and Reardon end up sleeping together. To me, these two were meant for each other. And their chemistry together was so beautifully represented in every fucking scene that they were in. There were sparks flying, even before they realized they liked each other. Sparks were flying. Especially the day after the first time they sleep together. This is a great part where Hank is so ridden with guilt the day after that he has just basically broken this bond with Lillian and cheated on her for Dagny that he actually starts insulting her. He calls Dagny a whore for God's sakes and and this is the line that really stood out to me. He says if you wish to hit me go ahead I wish you would. I wish you would. That's an interesting line. But instead of Dagny you know flipping out she was shocked, but instead of her freaking out, she starts to laugh and goes on about how she, too, wants Hank for his mind, for his heart, for his body, and that she's proud to be with him. And over the years, they do truly fall in love. She feels she's earned the right to sleep with Hank Reardon, and that Hank Reardon has earned the right to sleep with her. It was natural. It was nice. And they were in love. And, and it's clear that Hank just loves Dagny so much and just thinks of the world of her. Uh, and he even compromises his own personal law to protect her. You know, instead of being the man to stand up and show everyone how corrupt and wrong the government is during, during his trial, uh, which is one of my favorite scenes of all time in fiction, he lets the government take his work, the work he loves, just to simply keep his affair with her a secret from the world, not only for, you know, her, mainly for her sake, but also for Lillian's. During this time period that the book was, was written, I want to make this very clear, this, is, this book was released in 1957. Affairs and divorces were much more of a taboo back then than they were today. It seems like today every marriage ends in divorce. Uh, you know, it, it's such more of a common thing to hear, oh, I got divorced. Back then it wasn't. You know, back then, marriage was much more binding than it is today. Which is probably, to be honest, why they cut out a lot of this romance in the movie. Because, you know, it just seemed kind of silly. Why doesn't he just admit to it? No one would give a shit. And he'd go along in his merry way. While back then, certainly was a lot bigger of a deal. But unfortunately, yet soon Dagny goes with Galt. John Galt. And to be honest, I really don't like that. You know, it, it's sort of funny how 
people throw around ships like there's no tomorrow, like, like oh, I ship these two characters and blah, 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 blah. I'll joke about that a lot, like, oh, I ship these two characters and so on and so forth. I really genuinely ship Reardon and Taggart. Because they did make such a great power couple. And they completed each other in many ways. But then all of a sudden she runs off with John Galt. Galt, John Galt, to me, has always been a letdown. I, I never really liked him. I love his build-up, and I love his ideals, and I love that speech he gives, even though it's way too long. But he, to me, he's just a letdown be because he shouldn't have been a love interest. But instead, he should have been a leader figure, an actual leader, unlike most of these people in the book that are supposed to be leaders. One that people look up to. She learns of what Reardon did, you know, giving up his medal to keep their secrets safe, and tells the world on radio that she loved Hank and is proud to have been his lover, which is a great scene in book three. She basically is telling everyone to go fuck off. You think you're going to blackmail me about this, about being in love with Hank Reardon and him loving me back? No. No, you're not. Screw you. I'm done caring. Now, it becomes clear to Reardon that she is in love with somebody else. And despite being heartbroken, because he's always going to love Dagny. It's very clear by that that he's always going to love Dagny. Despite knowing Dagny would never love him how he loves her. This moment that he hears her going on and saying with pride that, he slept, that she slept with him. is the first time Hank's mind and his heart were in true sync with one another. Which, that's what his character has been leading to this entire time. That's what every major character in this movie is trying to, or in this book, is trying to lead to. To have their mind and their heart in sync at the same time. And even as they say their goodbyes to one another, Hank actually breaks down a little and finally says to her what he was afraid to say for so long. And he truly loves her. He admits it. He's like, I love you, Dagny. I, I want you. I need you. I would have made them stay together. Instead of, uh, instead of Dagny uh, being, for lack of a better term, a bit of a whore going off with John Galt. <laughs> Book three, for everything good it does, there's like two or three things that just aren't really well put together structure, structurally. And I think thematically it would have worked better for her to have stayed with, with Reardon instead of this knight in shining armor, John Galt, showing up, who, to me, is a boring character because he's flawless. He has he has none of the, the flaws of, of Hank. And the other thing that I don't like about him is that he's a main character that's introduced almost towards the end of the book. And I don't like that kind of structure. I never have, and I probably never will. There are a couple of exceptions to this. I think of Dr. Sarazawa, for example, being one of them. He's only in the movie for 15 minutes, but he's the most complex character in, in the original Godzilla. And he will always be an exception, you know, and nothing in this field is black and white. But John Galt is too perfect. He doesn't have the depth of Hank Reardon. He doesn't have the charisma of Hank Reardon. He, well, he does have the charisma, but a different type of charisma. Hank Reardon is someone you genuinely root for, and I, and I genuinely root for Galt on many things. I think what he's doing is great, you know, to go on strike against the people that are expecting to earn the unearned. And another thing, too, is that it's so sad because you just see Hank. Hank has been through so much because of his conflicting mind and heart, wanting to stay with Dagny and yet also run his business and stay with Lillian, who, who, is, who he's sworn by law to stay to. And no matter what, despite the lack of love, he's just been through so much shit that to suddenly have her walk off with Galt, to me, almost made all of it void. The first night that they slept together, Hank Reardon says this line. He says, I promised to myself I would never need anyone. And then he looks over at her, and, and, she, and he says, But I need you, Dagny. It's a great line, a great moment, and, and it says volume to who Hank is. A man truly afraid of the unknown and selfishness of their relationship. He wants Dagny so bad, and for a while, she wants him too. 
and it, it makes it makes me sad to see her go off with Galt in the end, and, and Reardon's conclusion is kind of left up in the air. It, it's left void. Though he makes it to Galt's Gulch, which is a terrible name. I hate that name. He's just been through so fucking much. And he, throughout all of it, he kept his head up and fought the entire step of the way for his medal, for Dagny, for, for himself. And in the end, he kind of ends up with nothing. And it goes to the poor structure of book three. The poor structure of it. That, that this happens. And it's not in a tragic way. Intentionally, that is. It is tragic. But intentionally... It's tragic because of how Ayn Rand writes him. By her mistake. And after all of this conflict... What I do like, it's this wet nurse that he calls... Who, who makes Hank ready to head for Galt's Gulch. You see, Galt's Gulch. When the government fails to stage an insurrection at his mills... This wet nurse sent to spy sent to spy on him is there now before this the person quits working for the government you know he was sent to spy on Hank and everything he quits this young man and he begs Reardon for a job as a grunt grunt work he says he, he wants to earn his own money he wants to earn his keep he's done of sucking money out of people's pockets and Hank had just turned down his freeloading piece of shit of a brother who simply wanted a desk job with no work and not only a couple scenes later but this boy comes up to Hank and says I, I want a job, and I'd work and work, and I'd earn it, and everything like that. And, and Hank goes, I'd hire you in a heartbeat. Again, that shows what kind of person Hank Reardon is. And this boy at the insurrection is hurt bad, horribly, during the battle at the mills. And is carried by Reardon until moving hurts the kid too much. He's going to die. And his last lines are, are the, the wet nurse goes, Is this what it feels like to want something? And Hank Reardon goes, yes, yes it is. It is at that moment that Hank's arc is complete. His mind and his heart are truly in sync, wanting to live and create. Yes, it is, he says. And Hank, you know, and he puts a smile on the boy's face before he dies. And it's almost as if Hank, at that moment too, realized that he had never felt that need of want before, quite like this. To want to live, to want to create until this boy's dying breath. This boy dying in his arms, saying he wants something, is what ultimately completes his arc. And then off he goes, finally free from the looters, as they call them, of society to Galt's Gulch. And he is my favorite character. Hands down, Hank Reardon. Uh, he is a warrior of a different kind. He, he's a man of the mind and not of the body like so many stories you know who Aaron Yeager from Attack on Titan who fights and so on and so forth no Hank Reardon is a man of the mind he thinks he creates he doesn't fight well he does fight just in a different way uh, he's earned everything he's got from his minds to his steel to the love of his workers who he treats with respect and honestly to the love of Dagny. He earned that. She earned it. I look up to men like Hank Reardon in real life. I really do. And aspire to be like him and men like that. Uh, though I know it can't be exact to, you know, Hank Reardon. But I aspire to be like them. And I look up to men like him. I'm not afraid to admit that. It is Hank Reardon's parts in Atlas Shrugged I read when I'm depressed, sad, or, or even confused as to what actions I, I should take with myself and, and thinking of others or myself and so on and so forth and I always read the parts with Hank Reardon I always go back and I bookmark them all where Hank Reardon gives a speech or Hank Reardon is trying to make a moral decision or Hank Reardon discovers something about himself I always read those parts over and over and over again and that is why he is my favorite character of all time in all of fiction all of fiction so go on Facebook, like AIN Production, for all up-to-date information we are doing on there. Like the Godzilla Saga for all up-to-date information of how those books are going. They're going quite well. Uh, hit the subscribe button for more stuff from me and other people on AIN Productions. And in the end, this is Adam Noyce of AIN Productions saying... Sayonara. Sayonara.